like to uh, I would like to thank Michaela for last week. That was <laughs> I, I, there was some words in there I couldn't do, and so she did better than I did. So anyway, I thank her for doing that. So anyway, today's <clears throat> today's scripture reading from God's Word is. Uh, Today's scripture reading is in Matthew 19, 29, and 30. <clears throat> and everyone who has left homes, houses, or brothers, or sisters, or fathers, or mothers, or children, or fields, for my sake, will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. So be it. Yes, no. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Logan can hear me. Because he's shaking his head. I'm on. How about now? Better? Okay. So those songs reminded me of when the first song came out about reckless love of Christ, of God or Christ, or however you want to say it. Is it Christ? Reckless love of Christ in the song? of God. There was a lot of people that said, I don't like that song because we always like to pick things apart. God's not reckless. And as I was listening to the words, it talks about the 99 and everything. And I'm thinking, you know, we go by the parables that come after that. One being the lost son is what I call the parable. We used to call that parable quite commonly the prodigal son. And then people said, ah, it's not about a prodigal son. It's about a prodigal God. Well, prodigal it's much more than just reckless. <laughs> Prodigal means extravagantly wasteful. You just cannot see the rationale that someone would be that wasteful. And when you read that parable over and over, the more times you read it, you realize it's not about the son. It's not about the younger son. It's not about the older son. It's about that father who was so reckless, extravagant, wasteful, whatever words you want to say, in our eyes and minds. But yet he loves us so much that he would give his only son to die for us. That's the kind of God that we have that loves us. And that song just reminded me of that. So yeah, worthy is the name of Jesus. Worthy. Father, we thank you today for the freedom that we have to come and worship you. Lord, open our eyes and ears that we may hear your words, that we may see the truth. Lord, we thank you for your spirit that ties us together. Teach us your word, Lord, that we may apply it to our lives and teach our children that we may be a light to this world. Father, we just thank you and praise you for the freedom that we have to come here and worship you today. May we honor you with our lives. May, we, may you open our, your word to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you're reading in your readings, you finished Judges yesterday, and you start Ruth today. If you haven't seen the movie The Book of Ruth, I brought in a few copies of that movie. We have played that movie here at a movie night before, but maybe you haven't seen it. Take the copy. It's yours. Share it with a friend. Invite somebody if you want to over, but it might help in your reading through of Ruth. And when you're reading Ruth, you'll be like, Whew, this is a pleasant thing for the, what I just read through Judges. Because Judges is tough. But think about it from this perspective again. Moses led the children of God. And he said, you guys continue to betray God, break his laws, everything else. 
You're going to suffer and wander around in the wilderness. I'm not even enter, entering in. He tells the next generations, please be faithful. Trust the Lord your God. Serve Him only. And we read Joshua. We see the same thing. We see that pattern over and over. Man, we need a Savior, don't we? We read in Judges that the judges ruled at that time and they did what was right in their eyes. <laughs> what was right in their eyes is terrible. Could you imagine this world without God being in control of it? Wow. The Bible says that man is desperate, his heart is desperately wicked. His thoughts are on evil all the time. We like to think that we're good and we keep getting better and everything. But if God didn't have his hand upon us, what you read in Judges would be nothing in comparison to what this world would be like. Praise be to God that we see in Ruth, we see compassion and love, and we see a kinsman redeemer talking about Jesus Christ coming, that God would have that kind of reckless love that he would send his son to die for us. So I wasn't going to preach on Judges, <laughs> but Mary Ann's words kept ringing in my head. <laughs> she said, I don't know if I even want to read Judges. Because the video said how gruesome and everything it was. It was disturbing and violent. But the Bible Project gives a good story analysis for you reading it. It's very instructional and, and it's pretty good on what it says. I don't know if I agree that the judges get progressively worse. I think they're just bad. <laughs> There's some good in there every once in a while. And God has his hand on each and every one. Don't forget that. Just like God used Pharaoh to release his people so that they could worship him. God used Judas to betray Jesus Christ so that he could die for our sins. And God used these judges, even Samson, who was so worried about himself and everything else, God used him. And we read about him elsewhere in Scripture. We read about him in Hebrews 11, the Hall of Faith chapter. So God was with those judges even though they did some herocious things. Now that made me examine myself. <laughs> How many herocious things have I done? It made me think of David. What are things did David do? But God called him a man after his own heart. Don't condemn God for the actions of his people. But let that be a lesson to you so that you learn from it, so that you do live a life obedient to God that brings Him glory and honor, showing that you fear and love Him, showing that your children that your faith is genuine rather than it being hypocrisy. So the Bible Project talked about these different leaders, and then we get to this guy named Jephthah who was in the bad column before um, Samson. And what did Jephthah do? He made a vow. That's what he did. What's the title of the sermon? Well, yeah, <laughs> making vows to the Lord. And that was in the song as well, right? Think about the vows you make. God didn't tell him to make a vow to sacrifice his daughter. We'll get into that in a little bit, what that vow was and everything. But if you make a vow, just like our scripture reading was on, God expects you to do what you tell him, to be fearful of him. Now, don't let that bring into all kind of theological debates about would God have let him make that vow and everything. I believe God asked Abraham to go sacrifice his son. Now, he interceded, didn't he? We don't know exactly what happened in this story, but we'll, we'll reveal it in, as best we can. But remember that God is a holy God. We're an unholy people. <laughs> we are a holy people because we've been sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ now. We are holy, set apart, sanctified, justified completely in God's eyes because of what Jesus Christ did, not because of what we do. Okay? So I'm going to play part of that video so that we can remember what it said exactly and then look at it. We all have sinned, we all fall short, and we deserve the punishment fit for the person that we are sinning against. That is the God of all the universe. But yet he loves us. Go ahead, Logan.
Kim's trying. Do we keep on talking till you get it up? Oh, you got, huh? Okay. I like that too. So while we are waiting, I will say this to give you some food for thought. Okay. The book of Judges. So remember after Joshua led the tribes of Israel into the promised land, he called them to be faithful to their covenant with God by obeying the commands of the Torah. And if they do this, they will show all the other nations what God is like. So Judges begins with the death of Joshua and basically tells the story of Israel's total failure. The book's name comes from the type of leaders Israel had in this period. Before they had any kings, the tribes were all governed by these judges. Now don't think of a courtroom. These were regional political military leaders, more like a tribal chief. And you need to be warned, the book of Judges is very disturbing and violent. It tells the tragic tale of Israel's moral corruption, of its bad leadership, and basically how they become no different than the Canaanites. But this sad story is also meant to generate hope for the future. And you can see this in how the book's designed. There's a large introduction that sets the stage for Israel's failure as they don't drive out the remaining Canaanites. Then the large main section of the book has stories about the growing corruption of Israel's judges. And the progression here shows how Israel's leaders go from pretty good to okay to bad to worse. The concluding section is really disturbing and shows the corruption of the people of Israel as a whole. So let's dive in, and we can explore each part a bit more. The opening section begins with the tribes of Israel in their territories in the promised land. And while Joshua defeated some key Canaanite towns, there was still a lot of land to be taken and lots of Canaanites living in those areas. And so chapter 1 gives a long list of Canaanite groups and towns that Israel just failed to drive out from the land. Now, remember, the whole point of driving out the Canaanites was to avoid their moral corruption and their way of worshiping the gods through child sacrifice. God had called Israel to be a holy people, and that does not happen. Chapter 2 describes how Israel just moved in alongside the Canaanites and adopted all their cultural and religious practices. And it's right here that the story stops. For nearly a whole chapter, the narrator gives us an overview of everything that's about to happen in the body of the book. This part of Israel's history, the narrator says, is a series of cycles moving in a downward spiral. So Israel became like the Canaanites, and so they would sin against God. So God would allow them to be conquered and oppressed by the Canaanites. And eventually, the Israelites would see the error of their ways and repent. So God would raise up a deliverer, a judge, from among Israel who would defeat the enemy and bring about an era of peace. But eventually, Israel would sin again, and it would all start over. This cycle provides the literary design and flow for the next main section of the book. It gets repeated for each of the six main judges whose stories are told here. Now the stories of the first three judges, Othniel, Ehud, and Deborah, they are epic adventures. They're also extremely bloody stories. Either the judge themselves or people who help the judge, they defeat their enemies and deliver the people of Israel. The stories about the next three judges are longer, and they focus in on the character flaws of the judges, which get increasingly worse. So Gideon, he begins pretty well. He's a coward of a man, but he eventually comes to trust that God can save Israel through him. And so he defeats a huge army of Midianites with only 300 men carrying torches and clay pots. But Gideon has a nasty and he murders a bunch of fellow Israelites for not helping him in his battle. And then it all goes downhill from there. He makes an idol from the gold that he won in his battles. And then after he dies, all Israel worships the idol as a god, and the people <coughs> begin to die. The next main judge is Jephthah, who's something of a mafia thug living up in the hills. And when things get really bad for Israel, the elders come to him, begging for his help. 
And Jephthah was a very effective leader. He won lots of battles against the Ammonites. But he was so unfamiliar with the God of Israel, he treats him like a Canaanite God. He vows to sacrifice his daughter if he wins the battle. This tragic story, it shows just how far Israel has fallen. They no longer know the character of their own God, which leads to murder and to false worship. The last That's judge, good, Samson, yeah. is by far the worst. His life began... Okay, so now let me tell you what we've read so far, and if you've read it, you know it, but let's review. In the beginning, God, right? God created everything because he desired to. He created mankind in his image. He instituted marriage. He instituted the ability to have children, and children are a heritage and blessing from the Lord. We had one command, and we disobeyed it. The world became progressively more and more unfamiliar, like the video says, with God, to where that sin was rampant all the time. And there was only one man in the world that God found as righteous, Noah. So Noah, out of holy fear, built an ark because of the destruction that was coming, because God has every right to judge his creation, period. And as a Christian, again, you can see that. As a world looking out, we sometimes don't see that. But as a Christian, you can see that you want God to judge sin. You want a perfect heaven. You want that relationship restored. But when non-Christians read the Old Testament, they tend to see a violent God because of the acts of his children. Don't forget that. And he's bringing punishment down. So as you see this in Judges you see that Israel did not destroy all the pagan people in the land. They intermarried with them. They didn't destroy the idols in the land, and the idols were a constant reminder to them, a temptation to them, if they would have only obeyed the Lord their God. And as Noah went in the ark, as there were judges that led the people, as Joshua led his people into the promised land, land, which means that salvation is coming, or salvation, same name that Jesus is in the New Testament, it tells us of God's love for us. <laughs> Why? Why would God be so reckless in his love except it is who he is? He is a loving, righteous, holy God. And it's only by grace we're saved through faith. We've done nothing except deserve the opposite. So we're now we're to this time in the land of Israel, God's chosen people that are supposed to show the world who God is, and instead they're showing him how awful they are. And they become just like the heathens in the land. To where Jephthah arises up, and you can't tell any difference in his faith than you can in the Canaanites' faith. And maybe that's where it comes from that he made the vow that he made. Maybe he didn't even think about, because he was so unfamiliar with God, that, that a human sacrifice would be pleasing to God. Our God does not want a human sacrifice. He wants our love, our obedience, because of what he did for us, and he even empowers us with his spirit so that we can do it because we look all through history and we see that there's no way we can do it. So then that brings me to a thing that people who are unfamiliar with Christ say, well, God just makes a bunch of rules we can't keep. That's not fair. Let me remind you again. There was only one rule in the garden. We had everything we could eat. Just don't eat from this tree. And we still disobeyed. Okay, then there was Ten Commandments. Ah, some of them you say, yeah, I don't really think I'm going to murder or steal. Well, Jesus enlightened us on that, the truth about that. But we look at those and say, well, that's not hard. Let's keep them. But yet we don't, do we? Even ourselves. Yes, I'm pointing. <laughs> and Jesus was clear because he said, if, a brother, if you hate a brother in your heart, you've committed m murder in your heart. So you can see that there is a people including ourselves, that are sinful by nature. And the only, only way we're going to be made right with God is if God himself gives the offering for us through his son, Jesus Christ. So let's look at ju Judges a second. But first I want to go to the New Testament and remind you of an awful person who then used his new life 
to tell others of Jesus Christ. His name was Paul or was it Saul? It was Saul and then it was Paul. So I got a question for you. When did Jesus change Saul's name to Paul? Anybody? Jesus didn't. <laughs> it's a trick question. There's no proof that Jesus changed. Jesus met Saul on the road to Damascus and said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And it never says that Jesus called Saul anything different. You know what the word Saul means? Well, let's go back to the Old Testament and kind of remember that. What does Saul mean? Desired. One that's desired of men. One who could easily think of himself in a prideful way, of which Paul talked about. He said, I, if anyone has a right to boast, I do. But because he met Jesus Christ, he said, I'm going to become something more familiar. In fact, we read in Scripture, he says, I'll become whatever to, what, to men, anything I can to win them to Christ. To a slave, I become a slave. To a Jew, I become a Jew. A Greek, I become a Greek. So he changed his name to a common word, Paul, which means small and insignificant. Because <laughs> his life meant nothing anymore. Because he was redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. The very one that he persecuted and then persecuted his followers till he saw the light and it forever changed him. So in Philippians 3 verses 3 through 20 we read this. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit who boast in Christ Jesus, that's what our new life is for, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee. For zeal, I persecuted the church, and for, right, for righteousness, based on the law, I was faultless. But whatever were gains to me, now I consider lost for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, garbage, trash, something to be disposed of, of no worth whatsoever, that I might gain Christ and in Him be found not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God and on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of His resurrection and to participate in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ. And I'll pause here just to say, is that your view of your purchased life in Jesus Christ? All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join together in following my examples, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before and now tell you again, with, with, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross. This is words to fellow believers. Their destination is destruction because maybe they're a goat instead of a sheep, even though they think they're a sheep. Their God is their stomach, and their glory is their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Saul, a man who persecuted and killed Christians, who despised Jesus Christ, who condemned him to death, now lives his life to serve his Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. God can use any of us. God wants to use any of us, every one of us, to bring him glory and honor. And guess what? He will have his glory and honor whether you follow him the way you're supposed to or not. Look at Pharaoh again. Look at Judas. Look at these judges that he used. 
Paul also says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22 and 23, I have become all things to all people so that by all means I might save some. That's what he lived for, to die for Christ so that others could know him. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. That's why we're to take up our cross and follow after Jesus. But the only way that we can do that is to deny ourselves first. That our life was created in the first place by God for His pleasure, for His desire, for His purpose, and that it was bought back again at the blood of Jesus Christ. So how much more should we live an obedient life compared to what the Israelites should have lived but failed at. Here's a quote from some modern Christians. C.S. Lewis says this, Now the whole offer for which Christianity makes is this, that we can, if we let God have His way, come to share in the life of Christ. If we do, we, see, we sh shall then be sharing a life with which He ha be has begotten, not made, which always existed and always will exist. Christ is the Son of God. If we share in this kind of life, we also shall be sons of God. We shall love the Father as He does, and the Holy Ghost will arise in us. He came to this world and became a man in order to spread to other men the kind of life He has. By what I call good infection, every Christian is to become a little Christ. The whole purpose of becoming a Christian is simply nothing else. So what did Christ do? He gave up everything. He said he had no place to lay his head. And then he laid down his life for the sake of others. And we're called to follow in his footsteps. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this, The cross is laid on every Christian. The first Christ suffering which every man must experience is the call to abandon the attachments of this world. It is that dying of the old man, which is the result of his encounter with Christ. As we embark upon discipleship, we surrender ourselves to Christ in union with his death. We give over our lives to death. Thus it begins. The cross is not the terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life, but it meets us at the beginning of our communion with Christ. When Christ calls a man, he bids him to come and die. Is this your viewpoint as a Christian? Is your life reflecting Christ? Can others see Christ in you? Last week I reminded you what Joshua closed out his letter with. He said, choose this day what is desirable for you. Don't forget that part first. Because if I choose what's desirable, it's not going to be to take up a cross. That's not desirable. But yet when I look at it in the scheme of all things and say that if I have to take up an instru instrument of persecution and death to have an eternal life of glory and honor and Jesus will reward us, we will be accountable, then I will gladly take up an instrument of death. And especially if it tells my children that my faith is genuine and draws them to God so that they can be restored. Why would we not? What seems like, oh, I don't want to do this, becomes the only reasonable, desirable thing that I could ever consider. So choosing what is desirable is for me and my household this day to serve the Lord and do whatever it takes to spend those years to build an ark out of holy fear so that my family can enter that ark with me and be saved. The scripture that Merle read says that we are to give up everything to serve Jesus. And then the next verse that he read says the promises that we will have. A hundred times an eternal life. Please, please open up your eyes so that you may see. Open your ears so that you may hear the Lord and apply these things. So let's look at Judges then and bring it into perspective. In Judges chapter 1, verse 6 and 7... Here we go, Merle. Adonai Bezek fled, but they chased him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and big toes. Now, we know this is going to be a weird book when we get right there, right? But let's see why. Verse 7. Then Adonai Bezek said, Seventy kings with their thumbs and big toes cut off have picked up scraps under my table. So he did the same. He was repaid, was he not? Okay. 
Now God has paid me back for what I did to them. They brought him to Jerusalem and he died there. Let me remind you of Jesus' words in Matthew 12, verse 36. But I tell you that men will give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. Do you think we're going to be accountable for our deeds? Especially for our deeds as new children, new life in Christ? I tend to think so. Later in Judges chapter 1, we read about the children of God failing and failing and failing to drive out the pagans from the land, failing to tear down their temples, failing to decide who they were going to serve. Chapter 2, an angel of the Lord appears and says that the children of God have not kept up their agreements, that they have not kept up their end of the covenant. They have not driven out the godless people. They have not driven out the false gods. And as a result... In verse 3 it says, Their gods will be a constant temptation to you. No wonder we have disturbing and violent acts recorded in the book of Judges. Judges chapter 2 verse 10 says, After that the whole generation had gathered to, to, gathered to their ancestors. Another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what He had done for Israel. Do you see the importance of training up your children and living a life that verifies what you believe? In verses 16 and 17 in Judges chapter 2, it says, Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. God did not forsake them. God held up to His end of the covenant. The reason we see the things that we see is because of how far the children of God had got from God. Okay? Verse 17, Yet they would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods and worshipped them. We're supposed to have a relationship, an intimate relationship with God, not prostitute ourselves out with foreign gods. They quickly turned from the ways of their ancestors who had been obedient to the Lord's command. So God raised up judges and God was with those judges. So as you read, you understand that God was with those judges. Doesn't mean that the judge did everything the way God wanted him to do it. Moses struck the rock instead of speaking to the rock and did not enter the promised land. Because he said, we have brought you people out of Israel, or out of Egypt. In verse 18, it says, whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with the judge. So don't think he wasn't. And he saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord relented because of their groan, groaning under those who oppress and afflicted them. But what about this guy, Jephthah? <laughs> How could be, the Lord be with this guy? Someone who would make a vow to sacrifice their daughter. Well, that's the way the video implied it, so you've got to read it, because that wasn't a vow that he made. He didn't make a vow to sacrifice his daughter. But he did make a vow to sacrifice something or someone. Okay? So we have to read back and see, was Jephthah bad? Well, yes, they were all bad. That's why I said, I think, cross topic, but bad, 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 bad. <laughs> what difference does worse make? Right? If you're obedient, you're obedient. If you love the Lord, you love the Lord. When you make a mistake, you do like David said and says, Search me, O God. Show me my iniquity so that I may lay them before you. Forgive me of my sins. Only you have I sinned against. Restore me. Because we all sin and fall short of God's glorious standard. Don't forget, verse 18 of Judges 2 said, Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with that judge. That includes Jephthah, doesn't it? Then in verse 29 it says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jephthah in Je Judges chapter 11. So twice we see that God was with Jephthah, right? All right, let's read in Judges chapter 11 verse 30 then. Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. If you give the An An Ammonites into my hands, whatever. You can go study that word back and see what, whatever you come up with that word. Okay. Comes out of the door of my house. Well, now that makes it a little more specific, doesn't it? Whatever intends to apply something living, and it intends to apply, imply a human being because it comes out of the door of my house. Well, the next says it even more, to meet me. Well, a dog might come out to greet you or meet you, but generally we're talking about a person welcoming you home. When I return in triumph from the Ammonites, 
uh, will be the Lord's and I will sacrifice it. Well, maybe that just means dedicating it to the Lord for service like Levites. And as you read commentaries and everything, you'll see that they're all over the place. Okay? When you read God's Word, you read it learning from a personal God who is speaking to you. You don't have to have all the answers. But what answer you do need to have is what God is saying to you so that you can be obedient to it. Okay? You don't have to figure out this story to know God's will and design. You do need to know enough about the story to answer to other people when they say, how could God allow all this? Well, what has He allowed you to do in your life? Right? He allows you because you have free will and we chose to sin and we're in a fallen creation. But God so loved the world that He sent Jesus. That reckless love that you think that God wouldn't do that, but yet He did. He sent His only Son to die for you so that you could be restored. That kind of explains these things. I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. Okay, now wait a minute. <laughs> now we're getting even more specific. A burnt offering. That means it's totally burnt up. It's gone. Okay? And we've read all those things about burnt offerings before. Verse 32, Then Jephthah went over to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gave them into his hands. Okay, now we've got a vow, and we've got that God did what he said he would do. What's Jephthah going to do? Scripture we started off with this morning says, don't make a vow in haste. And if you make a vow, keep the vow. Don't come and say, I can't make the vow now because I made a foolish vow. You made a vow. Okay? Uh, then Jephthah, uh, excuse me, verse 33. He devastated 20 towns from a a a Arior and the vicinity of Mineth as far as Abel Keramim. Then Israel subdued Ammon. When Jephthah returned to his home in Mizpah, who should come out to meet him but his daughter, dancing to the sound of timbrels? Now, who do you think would come out when you came home from battle, except one of your family? Maybe one of your servants. Maybe he meant to sacrifice a servant. I don't know. You're not going to find the answer there that you're looking for. You're going to find a people that need God. And if they would have been obedient and drove out the foreigners in the land, which is said in the first of that vi video, the difference in the pagans is they sacrificed their children. That was one of the things they did for their gods. It was his daughter that came out dancing with the sound of timbrels. She was an only child. Except for her, he had neither son nor daughter. Now that puts a little more perspective into it. He's going to, his name's not going to carry on now, and we see the importance of that. So a lot of commentaries will say that for sure that meant that, that he was going to place her into the Lord's service and she just would be, continue to be a virgin. But let's read on, okay? When he saw her, he tore his clothes and cried, Oh, no, my daughter, you have brought me down and I am devastated. If my daughter had to go on to the Lord's service, that wouldn't devastate me. I would be happy for that. I would want to have children, but I would also have faith that God would allow someone else and to carry on my name anyway. I'm going to need a son instead of a daughter in that day and age. So I'm still leaning towards human sacrifice. Okay? I have made a vow to the Lord that I cannot break. Did I say it right? Yeah. My father, she replied, you have given your word to the Lord. I find that part astonishing because the children are still somewhat following the Lord more than their parents. Praise be to God that he still makes his presence known when we don't even train up our children the way we should. Okay? Because she knew it meant something, whatever it means. Do to me just as you promised now that the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the Ammonites. Let me remind you of some more words of Jesus before we go on. Matthew 10, verse 32 to 39. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be members of his own household. Now, this is not exact comparison, but we can use this as a principle, okay? Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. There's the key there. Who do you love? Who did you make the vow to? Who is Lord? 
Abraham, Scripture says, went to sacrifice Isaac, never hearing of the resurrection of the dead or anything, but having faith that God could even raise Isaac from the dead. He had every intention to kill his son according to Scripture. But he knew God had made him a promise and he knew God was big enough to even bring his son back. I don't know if that implies in this story here. I have no idea. But what I do know is that God calls me to love and serve Him first. Even my children are a blessing from Him. And I should cherish every day that I have and not make foolish vows, but instead train them up, talk about God when they get up, when they go to bed, when they sit down, when we're going to work, whatever it is, and to live a life that shows that. Verse 37, anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross, whatever that instrument of persecution and death is, and follow after me is not worthy of me. I think you're seeing a pattern here. Is not worthy of Jesus. Whoever finds their life will lose it, just like Saul did becoming Paul. All the things he had thought in his life that mattered before were meaningless as garbage. Garbage. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Now and forevermore. That's a promise from now and forevermore. So let's go back to Judges. But grant me this one request, she said. Give me two months to roam the hills and weep with my friends because I will never marry. Well, she didn't say she was going to die. She said she wasn't going to marry, did she? Well, of course, she can't marry if she's dead too, right? I don't know the answer. Verse 38, you may go, he said, and he let her go for two months. She and her friends went into the hills and wept because she would never marry. There, we've got it again. After two months, she returned home to her father, and he did to her as he vowed. We know what his vow was. I don't know what happened. You don't know what happened. Don't worry about it. See the whole picture. Don't make foolish vows. Train up your children instead. God is God. Even when His children obey Him, He's still faithful. And He recklessly loves us enough to send His Son to die for us. <laughs> she was a virgin. From this t comes the Israelite tradition that each year the young women of Israel go out for four days to commemorate or lament to remember the daughter of Jephthah the Gilead. So no expert knows. Read all the commentaries you want. Be decided that you don't know the answer, and that's good. You're not going to know everything. I think when Jesus' disciples said when he was leaving, they said, are you going to restore the kingdom of heaven at this time? And he said, it's not for you to know. But I will give you power, power from on high, the one that seals you as a child of God, and you will be my witnesses. You will tell one another about the gospel message, the love of God through the Father. Well, if you don't know it, Jephthah is mentioned in Samuel, and he's also mentioned in Hebrews. And Hebrews says in verse, well, I'll start in verse 32, Hebrews chapter 11. By faith the walls of Jericho fell after the people had marched around them for seven days. By faith the prostitute Rahab, remember her? We just read about her. Because she welcomed the spies in peace, did not perish with those who were disobedient. And what more shall we say? Um, time will not allow me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah. Right there it is. He made the Hall of Fame. How could Jephthah make the Hall of Fame? Except that he finally came to realization and committed his vow to the Lord, and we don't know the rest of the story? Maybe God rose her from the dead. I don't know. You don't know. But what I know is Scripture says God was with him. The Spirit of God came upon him. That he worked through the judges, even in their ferocious deeds. We see Samson. We see Gideon. That God worked and saved his people. I see a glorious God who is faithful and loving, merciful and kind. I see a God who would send His only Son to die for me. So how could I not be forever changed? I'll close with these final words of Jesus from Mark 8. Then He called the crowd to Him along with His disciples and said, 
Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospels will save it. Sounds familiar because we read it from, from Matthew. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? That's a rhetorical question if you don't understand it. Nothing. You can do nothing. But God has already done it for you. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when He comes in the Father's glory with His holy angels. Father in heaven, we thank You that You are a faithful God. That You are a faithful God even when everyone in the world except one man was found righteous because of his faith. Wow, what a loving God you are. And we thank you that you would send Jesus Christ to die for us. We thank you that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father now, pleading that we are your children, that the Spirit seals us and empowers us for this journey in life that we have to lose our life to live for Jesus, and that Jesus is preparing a place, and one day he will return to bring us home. Oh, Father, we thank you. May you continue to be faithful, which we know you will. May you raise up your spirit in us so that we live a life of worth to you, Father, and train up our children to follow after you. We thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I've got a closing video instead of a song.